not come to the African American Civil War Museum without talking to Harry Jones. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to get him the floor for a few minutes, and then you're welcome to stay. And uh, I said, enjoy the museum, enjoy the food, enjoy the drink, and uh, thank you, so Harry. Oh, thank you. And it's with great trepidation I speak for only five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Our exhibit is entitled The Glorious March to Liberty. We tell the Civil War from a perspective that I would argue has never been presented in a museum in this country. It is the, pers it is the perspective of the African American history makers, of the history makers. In our exhibit, you will not see a quote from a single scholar. If you were not there in the making of the history, you do not get a quote in our exhibit. You had to be there to get a quote. Some of the language is quite different than what we've been uh, given in our classrooms. A couple of examples of how our perspective is very different. Nathaniel Turner, often it said he conducted a, a rebellion, an insurrection. Well, if you track the African descent leadership, Martin Delaney in particular, in his writings, it was not a rebellion. In fact, Nat Turner himself says that you've asked me the motivations for this insurrection as you call it. In other words, that's not what I call it. So what did they call it? A demonstration. Demonstrating that if the planters did not set the slave free, there was going to be a bloodletting. Or as David Walker would say, they're going to bring sword against sword and there's going to be a party of a red sea of blood from which the captives was asked to be free. So it's Nat Turner's demonstration. Another example in our exhibit is John Brown. John Brown had a plan he wrote his own constitution. He goes to Chatham, Canada West, and he meets with Martin Delaney and a group of men who had already organized and already had a plan. When Delaney refuses to follow John Brown, John Brown calls him a coward. Okay. Delaney responded, Captain Brown, emphasis on captain, Captain Brown does not know the man of whom he speaks. There is no one in whose powers, blood, the blood of cowards falls less freely. And it must not be said, even by John Brown. Now, Captain Brown, why did we call him Captain Brown? Captains do not command generals. <laughs> Delaney had a plan that he was functionally the general within the African descent community, community at that time, with William Howard Day being his only superior. And that's Delaney's writing that tells us that. And so, John Brown has tactical value in what he's doing. Captains do not command generals. Captain Brown, even when you read Frederick Douglass, he calls John Brown. Captain Brown, and we put that in our exhibit. So we tell the, the story from the perspective of these American history makers. We break other myths. There's also these myths, most of the people get it from the movie Glory, that these were men who didn't know their left foot from their right foot. They were completely incompetent, all things military. That is a false image. Even in the 54th Massachusetts, there was no Irish drill sergeant. The lead drill sergeant was Lewis Douglas, Frederick Douglass, the eldest son. And Shaw would write in his actual letters, which were not used in the movie, they came to camp well drilled. Benjamin Butler would say about the first regiment of, of African sent soldiers mustered in, and we have this quote in our exhibit, the Louisiana Native Guard, better soldiers never shouldered a musket. He would also say that they take to drill and learn more quickly than intelligent white men, including those from Harvard and Yale. And this is a quote in our exhibit. They were very competent. Grant would say, better soldiers, oh, excuse me, by arming the Negro, we've added a powerful ally. Notice he didn't say by freeing the Negro. He said by arming. And he didn't say we've just added more bodies to our army, as you will hear from most contemporary scholars. He said we've added what? A powerful ally. That's Adrian Peterson, Michael Vick, Ray Lewis. You get my point. Mm -hmm. Difference makers on the battlefield. When we cover things like Fort Pillow, a massacre in which Confederate soldiers outnumbering the Union soldiers by over 2,000 to 575, they take no quarters. They massacre. They do not take the prisoners. Often when you read about it, that's the end of the story. That's the last thing you read. Well, we tell the story on in which General John Logan said that the battle cry for the, our, black red, for our black soldiers became, remember Fort Pillow. It inspired them to great deeds of valor and struck with fear the hearts of the enemy. And on many a bloody field, Fort Pillow was avenged. So we tell the whole story, not just the first point. We tell the story of African-American soldiers who captured Charleston, South Carolina, the cradle of secession. We tell the story of African-American soldiers who captured Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy. We tell the story of the African-American soldiers who stopped Robert E. Lee's army at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. We tell the story of the African-descent soldiers who chased the governor of Texas out of Texas. 
Not when they get the word in Texas, because that's not what really happened. There were over 20,000 African-American soldiers in Texas before June 19th. So if you ever say June 19th is when they got the word, I'm sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> and the primary sources are accessible. In our museum, we only use primary sources. And we can guide you to every primary source we use. We can guide your students to every primary source we use. We can guide them to the primary sources. So we can tell the story from the history makers. That's what we do in this museum. We tell the story from the perspective of the history makers. So welcome and use our museum so that your students will know the story from the history makers. Thank you.